This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So um, today I'm going to be talking about research um, that we're doing at UCLA primarily, um, exclusively in autism and primarily in imaging in uh, genetics. Um, and I don't really need to tell you very much about um, autism and autism spectrum disorders, so I'll just skip over that, you know, the general intro to autism, which I include just in case somebody doesn't uh, know anything about it. But what I do like to add at this point is that autism is, as you probably know, among the most genetic of complex behavioral disorders. But unfortunately, as you know also, the genetics are extremely complex. Um, when I wrote this slide, they, Dan said, Dan Geshkwin, who I work with closely, says they're at least 30 autism risk genes, but now, last time I spoke to him a few days ago, he said there were 150. So it, there are lots and lots of risk genes associated with autism. None of them are causal, and none of them have big effect sizes, um, which makes studying um, the genetics of autism extremely difficult. Um, in addition, I'm a, I'm a brain imager, so I'm interested in functional and structural brain imaging, and numerous structural and functional brain um, abnormalities have been reported um, uh, in autism, at, mostly at the group level. Very little actually has been done um, at the individual subject level that it would allow us to do something that's diagnostic, but at least we can learn a lot about mechanism by studying the brain in a variety of different ways. So today what I'm going to be focusing on is um, how um, we can use imaging genetics as a way to link genes, behavior, and brain in a way that I think um, helps us to understand more about the whole pathology and developmental uh, trajectory of the disorder and how we can think about ways of, of, um, of approaching interventions with that in mind. Um, so asking the general question, how can we use genetic information to help us understand the neural mechanisms which lead to autism and in particular to the behaviors, the complex behaviors that we see in autism? And there's lots of ways that we can look at, at genes. You can, look, you can do gene expression profiling. You can do knockout models in uh, animals. Um, you could look at syndromic autisms like Fragile X and other um, less common uh, syndromes, and all these are really great ways um, to, to look at um, autism genetics. Um, if you want to look at humans um, for the vast majority of non-syndromic um, individuals with autism, um, then you have to start going into the realm of common polymorphisms. Um, and we've been um, using this approach to combine behavior imaging and genetics using common polymorphisms. And I'm going to just try to convince you why I think that is an approach that is um, surprisingly effective. Um, so what I'm going to talk about it, uh, over the course of the next 45 minutes or so is um, three autism risk genes that we We've uh, studied their relationship to brain um, function, and particularly to brain uh, functional connectivity. And I'm going to talk um, more specifically about properties of, of um, connectivity in the brain in a more general way, what constitutes a well-connected brain? What do we mean by connectivity, and, and how can we make sense of that in a way to really help us understand um, how processing is different when connectivity is altered, um, primarily focusing on graph theoretical methods. So just as a, as a background, when we think about um, disco gene discovery and how we use genes to discover, um, how, how do we try to, to discover genes for disorders like autism, the traditional approach, of course, is to try to, you know, is, is to try to grab huge samples of individuals and find specific genes that are associated with this entire um, syndrome called, uh, called autism, as, as if we can have this one-to-one -one, uh, relationship here. And I think that all of us really know that, that life is way more complicated than that. Um, we have multiple, multiple uh, genes, and including things that like gene-gene interactions that will relate to autism risk, environmental factors that probably interact with these genes and these gene-gene interactions um, to, to add to um, autism risk, and also other genes that are probably protective genes that decrease the risk for autism, all of these interacting together. And it's a very complicated thing if you're trying to find genes 
to understand autism um, and therefore under, you know, give us a place where we can start to understand mechanism. Um, the imaging genetics approach is one in which we think of genes as having effects not on disease but on brain and on specific aspects of brain structure and, and function. And we um, suggest that um, genes, of course, will have their first immediate effects on, on, uh, on the brain and that in, different genes may affect different parts of the brain. And in turn, they may affect different autism phenotypes. There's no reason to think that all of the autism risk genes are going to affect the same brain systems um, and then therefore the same phenotypes and then lead us to this syndrome uh, called autism. Um, so by looking at multiple different genes and looking at their independent effects on the brain, then I think that we have a better better chance to look at specific mechanisms, even though they're not going to tell us all of autism, they're going to tell us bits and pieces of the autism puzzle. Um, so just as a quick background of imaging genetics and where we got to it, it this was the, the first functional MRI study that we did uh, way back in, oh my gosh, 2000, uh, which sounds like a long time ago, but I guess really isn't in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, in, in Alzheimer's, and, and that's how, it was this study that motivated the imaging genetics approach that we are now using um, in autism and a variety of other disorders. And um, this was a study that we did in the APOE4 gene for Alzheimer's risks. So APOE4 is the most replicated risk gene for a complex disorder. It is replicated in almost every single sample of, um, of Alzheimer's disease risk. So whenever you, you do a, a large cohort study of Alzheimer's and look for genes, this is the one that pops up on the top of the list. It's a very powerful effect. And there are no other genes that are like this for Alzheimer's or autism or depression or schizophrenia or anything else. This is a really, really powerful gene. But what we did in this case was we did a functional MRI activation study in older adults who were in the early 60s. So this is about 20 years before the onset of Alzheimer's disease. They were cognitively normal older adults, and, we, and they didn't know what their genotypes were. We just genotyped them and um, gave them a, um, a memory task, a hard memory task, that they could all perform equally well. So there were absolutely no cognitive deficits at this point. Everybody looked identical. Nobody knew that they had a risk for Alzheimer's disease. And we just looked at the activation pattern differences in those who did or did not carry one of these risk alleles. And to our... Um, to our, I will say, amazement, there were um, very large differences in um, brain activation profiles, very specifically that subjects who had the risk allele um, activated a lot more of the brain throughout the systems that were involved in this particular memory task, and it was specific to memory task performance. Um, just by virtue of having carried a, a risk allele, even though there was no disease, no disease underlying process that we could tell, the MRIs were normal in every other way. And um, we were surprised because we didn't think that a single allele could have such a big effect in the brain, but this has now been studied with many, many different genes, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and you can see major effects in the brain. So the brain is a really good intermediate place to look before you get to behavior, and it's way, way more sensitive than the behavior that we observe, and that's why we've taken this um, approach. So going very specific to autism, I, I always like to refer to this paper. It's one of my favorite papers. It's a review paper by Dan Geshwin and um, Brett Abrams from 2008. It's way outdated now. And I don't expect you to memorize all of these genes here. But So what they did was they took a, 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 any all of these genes that had been um, implicated in one way or another in autism, and they gave them a score, a weighting from 1 to 6, um, that, that said how much um, how much evidence was there for this being a, a, a true autism risk gene? Was it in a family association study? Was there a, um, a, a, a pathway that they could identify that was associated with pathways they thought were important in autism? Were there, um, were there cases of people with deletions, for example, or mutations in these genes that, um, uh, that were associated with autism? Were there syndromes associated with them? So they have this, this list of genes. And what's interesting when you look through the list is that although there are lots and lots of different genes, if you looked at their pathways, a lot of them share common pathways. In fact, there are only a couple of different pathways um, that, that, are, that you could really think of as independent. And the genes were expressed in the brain, and all of them were involved in some way with, with synapse formation, um, scaffolding, um, you know, forming dendrites, neural migration, everything that has to do with forming connections in the brain. And I think it's really remarkable that all of these um, genes that had, that had been identified through um, completely independent 
Planet Labs and completely independent um, methods tended to converge on the notion of forming synapses and forming connections in the brain very early in development. Um, so, um, uh, so if we think about this as connectivity, um, and that's really the approach that we are taking and many other groups are taking, um, we, we, much has been said and will continue to be talked about in the future, as we believe as well, of autism as a connectivity disorder. I don't think that's just autism, by the way. I think almost every developmental disorder is a connectivity disorder, so we really have to be more specific than that. But there's a great deal of evidence for it in, in autism. Um, there, are, there are studies of structural connectivity, white matter uh, volume um, from early infancy up through late adulthood um, that, uh, that show that the connecting fibers are different in a variety of ways. And um, that, so that would be a structural connectivity point of view. I'm not going to really talk about that other than to show one slide. Everything I'm going to be talking about is functional connectivity. Connectivity. There are several ways to look at functional connectivity. This is an ancient study from, um, um, from um, the uh, Carnegie Mellon group, Marcel Just's group, um, where we just look at, during a task, the pattern of activation during a task of two different regions and the extent to which activity in these different regions co-vary. So if you think of this as time and this is um, how much blood flow effectively is in these different regions, um, uh, areas of the brain that are highly connected to each other functionally will tend to go up and go down together. So here you might see a little bit of a disconnection, but throughout this whole profile over time, you can see that these two regions talk to each other a lot. And you can do this with activation fMRI, and you can do it with resting state fMRI, and I'll be talking about both. Um, and I also like to show this uh, study that most of you have seen from Joe Piven's group last year, um, showing differences in the trajectory of white matter development um, in, um, uh, I think this is a three to six month old cohort at high risk for developing autism. This is before actually knowing that they have um, autism. Um, but um, I, so this is a high risk plus and a high risk minus. You can see that the trajectories of development over um, this age range from, I think it's uh, six months to 27 months, shows that even quite early in life, there's a difference in the amount of white matter that they start out with in the callosum, but also in the trajectory of development being somewhat abnormal. And this is just in one part of the callosum. It's just a, one preliminary study. Hasn't been va uh, validated yet, but it's strongly suggestive, and even though there's a lot of variance across individuals, that that there are connectivity differences just in the basic structure very, very early in life. So today I'm going to be talking about three risk genes from this list that Dan has um, pointed out here um, that are listed here, the uh, MET gene, CATNAP2, and um, an oxytocin uh, receptor gene here. They're on the list of, of three or greater, um, so that, that is that there are multiple um, lines of evidence. And um, I would like to point out that, of course, there are many, many genes. I think I mentioned that we had at least 150 risk genes, and there are many SNPs on, on each of these genes that you could look at. So you've got a big range of data that you could pull from, and you have to find some way of reducing your data into something that's manageable and making choices that are good choices. And you also have this multiple comparison problem in the imaging world, because we've got all these voxels in the brain. They're only like one to three millimeters. So we've got like 28,000 voxels that we could be looking at. So how do we narrow down our data set how do we reduce our data onto something that's manageable and hypothesis driven so that we could be relatively confident in our results? And so we used a, an algorithm to do this. Um, so first of all, we, um, we chose genes that had been identified in large studies on more than one cohort. So if one lab found the gene, that wasn't enough. You had to have two labs that found a gene uh, using you know, large association studies or um, GWAS or whatever. Um, and that there also had to be evidence of some um, syndromic autism or, or some um, or a very, very excellent animal model or, um, or some um, a deletion syndrome or a family, uh, you know, a special family with a mutation in that same gene region that um, would add to that evidence. So we had to have at least those two different lines of genetic evidence. And we also had to have evidence for anatomic expression. So in other words, we didn't want to just say, well, we see the gene, it could, you know, we, it could show effects anywhere in the brain and that'd be okay with us. It wasn't okay with us. We had to know where we were looking. And there are a variety of different ways you could do that. One is to look at um, gene expression in normal 
populations of adults that had been done independently from us, or we could look at fetal brain expression. We've done both. But we had to have an, some kind of anatomical hypothesis that we could go to. And of course, we wanted um, that expression pattern to be related to a known autism phenotype, not to some random uh, behavior that wasn't relevant. So using all these criteria together, we picked a couple of genes. Obviously, we could have picked a lot more. We're still working on a lot more. But I'm just going to show you three, because we only have so much time in the day. Um, and so we've been trying to relate these to specific autism phenotypes. So the first one I'm going to be talking about is the language learning phenotype and the, um, and the CNTNAP2, which we fondly call catnap. It's just easier to say. Um, which is a, an interesting gene. You know that language impairment is a primary feature of um, autism spectrum disorders, which can vary from uh, language delay to being just a little abnormal to be completely absent in the more severe cases. Um, and it's associated with, um, uh, particularly language learning, associated with uh, frontostriatal circuits. This has been identified in a variety of studies, um, that um, in imaging studies, and we have um, found these circuits to be um, abnormal in activation studies in autism in, in virtually every study that we've done. Um, and uh, we think it's also important because I think that language learning is, is dependent upon social processing. I think language learning is a social learning task. It's not a memorization task. And, um, and it's linked to other behaviors that, I, that are critical for autism spectrum disorders. So the autism risk gene CATNAP2 um, was, um, was discovered based on a quantitative trait locus analysis. And I'm just going to show you uh, one slide of this. And, and, and it's the last genetic looking slide I'm going to show you because I'm not a geneticist. Um, but it's related very specifically to language delay in autism and in selective language impairment. So it's not an autism specific gene. It's a gene that's associated with language delay in autism, but also language delay in other disorders. So here's the original study that was done by Maricela Alarcon in um, Jane Geshwin's group. And it was a two-stage design. So they had, um, it, they, they, it is a conservative way of approaching looking at gene. And they're looking for linkage peaks that are associated with age of the first word. And the highest peak is up here. And that's the CATNAP2 gene. And um, uh, it, it, as I said, it is a shared risk with SLI. So we liked this gene because it was associated with language, and it came out with two cohorts. Um, in um, And there's also a, um, a deletion syndrome in, a, in an Amish family that's associated with high autism risk. Um, but also, um, we'd like to look at brain expression. And this is some fetal brain expression studies from Dan Geshwin's lab showing frontal and striatal um, expression of CATNAP2. And we were interested in that, too, because first of all, it tells us where to look. And it also told us that we were looking in places that we know to be very important in language acquisition. Um, so we, we really liked that. It's also, um, by the way, a circuitry that's important in other aspects that we think are critical to um, development of autistic behaviors, including reward processing, implicit learning, and motor skill learning, all of which are, are part of the autism spectrum. So. Um, to, to start with, to look at the, um, the regions that are associated with language development in kids with autism, I just want to point out this cute little study that was done by one of our former graduate students, Ashley Scott Van Zeelen. And um, we call this the Alien Languages Study. So in this study, um, these subjects, these are kids, um, typically developing kids and kids with autism, um, are put in the brain scanner, in the MRI scanner. And they're just presented with a series of syllables that they hear in a row. And they're told they're going to look at these different aliens, and these aliens are going to speak different languages to them. They don't have to do anything. Um, they, there is no active learning task. All they do is listen. But unbeknownst to the subjects, in um, some of the conditions, the um, syllables are not randomly put together, but they're put together in trios of three syllables at a time. They run continuously. So what the subject is hearing is something that sounds, sounds like Nemo lubari tu lido tu manata. And you can't make any sense of this. But um, probabilistically speaking, certain sound combinations of three will occur together in some of the conditions and not in the other conditions. And so it's a way of basically looking at language learning in a way that's entirely implicit in the brain. And um, this is what we found. Um, this is language learning in typically developing kids, and this is in the children with ASD. 
And just for those of you who are not um, um, intimately familiar with fMRI activation image and the images and the anatomy, um, let's just look at primary auditory cortex, which is robustly active in both typically developing and in children with, um, with autism, uh, which is fine because they're all hearing things, so we should have you know, great activation there. But there are areas that were clearly different between the groups, and mostly it was the absence of activity in inferior frontal cortex. So here we have nice activation in in the typically developing, none in the uh, ASD, medial frontal cortex, and in basal ganglia. And although I'm not showing the slides here, um, the basal ganglia activation correlates with the learning curve itself. So um, as, as the subjects hear the same syllables over and over again, there's a learning curve. It's, of course, it's implicit that goes, it's modeled up as this increasing function. And the activity here modeled closely um, the, the number of repetitions of the same syllables. In other words, learning is taking place in the brain, even though as far as the subjects are concerned, they're not learning anything. They're just hearing these random noises. Okay, But the brain processes that information in typically developing children, and it activates these language circuits. But it doesn't activate the same circuits in the kids with autism, even though they're hearing them. So we like this task because it's, um, it's entirely implicit. There's no difference in behavior that can explain our results. It's simply that the brain is processing that information differently. And it's doing so in these same areas that we found the catnap expression in. So uh, we liked that correlation, and um, uh, we wanted to explore this further. So um, I'm just going to talk about one other study that relates to the frontal striatal circuitry, um, and then talk about the catnap results. So um, we're very interested in social motivation and social reward processing. We think that language acquisition is largely dependent upon the reciprocal interactions between parents and their children, the rewarding smiles that you get back from parents when you pay attention to what the parent is saying and when you produce correct language and the parent smiles and nods and all of that. It's learning language as a social activity. Um, so we have thought of uh, social rewards as being primary reinforcers during um, uh, early development. Um, and we know this from, from many reasons. We also know uh, quite a bit about the circuitry. And I'm just going to focus on one part of the circuitry, which is the ventral striatum. So again, in the striatum, in the ventral part, we've got this region that is um, active during reward processing. And it, it's true for any kind of reward, um, but particularly true for social rewards. So the task that we developed um, to test this was an implicit learning social reward task. So subjects just saw these crazy little designs here and had to press a button whether this design goes with number one or goes with number two. And it's completely random. Um, and unbeknownst to the subject, um, some of the designs are associated more frequently with one number uh, versus the other number. But it's not 100% pr um, predictable. It's only probabilistic. And so the subjects guess. And they feel like they're guessing all the way through the task. But if you look at their learning curves, they actually are implicitly learning these associations. And if they get it right, they get the, a reward, which is the smiling face of one of our former graduate students. And if they get it wrong, they get the pouty face. Uh, and you might think that this is not a very rewarding stimulus. It, we show the same thing over and over again. But it turns out to be wicked rewarding. And um, these are typical, so these are jaded LA teenagers, right? And um, they see that smiley face, and that ventral serratum just lights up like a, like a candle here. And we don't see it in the kids with autism. And this is the difference between groups. So there is a, a, a real difference in how they're responding to rewarding stimuli that are social in nature. But what's also interesting is that it affects the learning curves. So the typically developing kids, if you look at the actual behavior of their responses, they show this nice learning curve for both. We, we, we studied both social rewards and um, monetary rewards. It didn't make a difference. The typically developing uh, kids learned, and the kids with autism uh, did not learn. Um, and notice, by the way, that the social rewards of that smiling face was more rewarding than money to, um, to, to teenagers. So it really is a primary reinforcer. So. Um, first, does this relate to behavior? Well, it does. In fact, what we found was that when we looked at the social responsiveness scale, and now this is just among typically developing children, because we already know that we're going to have impairments in kids with autism. But just looking at variance among typically developing kids, the magnitude of activity in the ventral striatum predicted the degree of social skills. So kids who had high activity in the ventral striatum did better, uh, had, had fewer social problems on the social responsiveness scale 
and those who were had more social problems had less activity. So it's not the activation is not seen in a vacuum. It truly is related to behavior that is relevant for social processing um, in typically developing kids. So. What we then wanted to do was to look at children, to genotype the children, and look at presence of the risk alleles on this catnap2 gene um, uh, using um, children who were in both of these kinds of studies. And the first thing that I'm showing you here is differences. This is um, combining across groups. So this is ir irrespective of, of diagnostic group, both ASD and typically developing kids, looking at genotype differences. Um, in um, activation. And these are the activation maps, and this is um, uh, th those who have the, who do not have the risk allele have greater activation in the ventral striatum and very part, various parts of the frontal cortex, particularly this medial frontal region and temporal lobe, which I showed you before, um, uh, that were important in, um, in the reward tasks in, in, in particular, but also to some extent in the language task. So those who have the non-risk allele, who do not carry the risk allele, have more activation in these regions. Now, taking that a step further is we wanted to do a functional connectivity analysis. So we took that um, area in the frontal lobe that was um, significantly different between the risk and the non-risk carriers, and then we asked the question, if I look at the time series of this region, taking out any effects of tasks, so regressing out any task effects, and just looking at spontaneous fluctuations of activity in this region, how is it connected to the rest of the brain in the risk and the non-risk populations? So that's the method of how it's done, and the result is um, uh, was interesting, and that was very simply that um, the more local areas were higher in the risk group and the long-range connections to the back of the brain were higher in the non-risk population. In other words, uh, what we found was stronger long-range connectivity in non-risk carriers and stronger short-range connectivity in risk carriers. So it's not simply a matter of connectivity is greater or smaller. It is where the connectivity is, that there is too much of this local processing and not enough of the long-range processing processing in individuals who carry the risk allele. And this, we, we, by the way, we verified this with, um, with uh, two cohorts. So um, in the, um, we, uh, we, we got a second large cohort of just normal children, um, kids without autism, and did the same thing. And we found the exact same uh, results in the exact same areas um, with this connectivity difference. So it does seem like the autism risk gene catnap was associated with the differences in activation in these critical regions that are, that are important in both language and social responsiveness. And, um, affected the short and long range connectivity in a very predictable way. The other thing that we found was that it was completely independent of diagnosis. So we found the same results in typically developing kids as we did in the kids with autism. So this is not simply a diagnos diagnosis effect, it's a genetic effect. And it's obviously not causal because we find the same effect in the TDs. Really what we're saying is that people with this gene have a certain pattern of brain activity and connectivity that biases towards a certain kind of processing. That's not gonna cause autism, but it's gonna bias towards a certain kind of processing that we think is going to be related to autism. Okay, the second gene we're gonna talk about is the oxytocin um, gene. And we'll be talking very specifically about the, um, the salience network in the brain. So let's first talk about the oxytocin receptor gene. Um, you probably all know oxytocin is a key regulator of social and affiliative behavior. Um, and uh, you can get a nasal preparation of this. It's nasally administered uh, in humans and it has been shown in experimental models in normal um, adults. Um, that it improves memory for faces, it improves the ability to infer the mental states of others, it improves generosity and the experience of trust when shown um, uh, faces. There's a, people give the higher trustworthiness um, uh, ratings to faces when they've been given oxytocin. Um, and you probably also know that a lot of parents are giving their kids ox nasal oxytocin to try to improve their, their autism. Um, even though the, uh, uh, there, there are only a couple of studies so far. Um, but uh, following oxytocin inhalation, subjects with ASD tend to display more appropriate social behavior, at least in small cohort studies. There are much bigger studies going on right now. So it's, you know, it's interesting. 
there are multiple SNPs, uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, on the oxytocin receptor gene that have been implicated in um, autism spectrum disorders. Here are a bunch of them, references that are listed up here. And this is one that we began to study. I won't go through the numbers because it's really boring. Um, but the A allele is associated with social deficits and empathy in normal uh, volunteers, deficits in attachment, reduced positive affect. It's associated with autism risk in two different um, independent samples. Um, and it's also been associated with altered brain structure and brain function. Um, this structural study showed um, decreases in hypothalamus and in this medial prefrontal region, which you will recognize as the region that I showed you in the last two studies that we talked about, same region. Um, and is also associated um, with decreased amygdala activation during um, a face matching. So this is the non-risk versus the risk carrier showing greater amygdala activation in response to faces. So it, it seems to be associated with the kinds of processes that have been recognized to be important in, um, in autism. Okay, and then the third gene I want to talk about is the um, is the MET gene, and um, and its relationship to social orientation and particularly the default mode network. Um, I probably don't need to tell this audience much about social orientation and face processing being extremely important in autism. Children with autism have difficulty understanding and internalizing emotional states in others. They tend not to look at the face region as much. They don't tend to to get as much back from looking at faces, even when we. Um, um, mark their, their eye gaze properly. Um, and um, there are um, a number of regions that are associated with face processing and, um, and eye gaze processing, and this includes areas in fusiform gyrus, temporal cortex, medial parietal, as well as um, inferior frontal cortex. And in, in particular, this medial parietal region is one that's of interest to us because it's a hub region for a, a network that we call the default mode network, which is a, a network that tends to um, shut off during task performance performance and increase when you're not doing a task. And there are lots of different theories about what this network is really doing. My own theory is that it's helping to disengage and engage when you need to, when you need to pay attention, when you need to shut down, that it's regulating that on and off um, attention, uh, attentional bias. But you know that's controversial. I won't, I won't swear to it. Um, anyway, so the MET receptor tyrosine kinase, or MET gene, there, um, there are multiple gene encoding proteins in this particular pathway, this ERK-P13K signaling pathway that are associated with AD uh, risk, and um, this pathway can be activated by the MET gene. We got this idea, by the way, from Pat Levitt, our colleague at USC. He was um, very excited about MET. He was so excited about it, because it wasn't even on our list, and so we just gave him blood, and he analyzed all of our blood samples for free, because he was so excited excited about it. It's highly expressed in temporal occipital medial parietal cortices, which is that same group of regions I was just talking to you about, important in phase processing and important in the default mode network. So it seemed like a good candidate for looking at the default mode network and in particularly in, in the social and phase processing. And there's a nice met uh, knockout, conditional knockout model um, that's got interestingly up-regulated up local circuit connectivity in both the homo and the heterozygotes um, in the these areas where it's densely expressed, particularly in occipital and temporal cortex. So that was great because that gave us anatomically a point to where we were going to be looking, a, a functional system that we wanted to be looking at that was relevant to behavior, and a gene that had been identified in um, both an animal model and in human risk studies. So um, one of our uh, former graduate students now um, uh, in medical school is an MD, PhD student, Jeff Rudy, and uh, um, particularly Marilla DiPretto and our other colleagues, Dan Gashwin et al. at, at Allet, uh, UCLA, did this study with 144 kids, um, 78 um, typically developing, and 66 ASD, and with different um, frequencies of, um, of the risk alleles. And um, he did this with a, uh, he did this in two ways. First was a passive observation of emotional faces task, and then also did it with a resting state task. Um, but let's look at this face processing task results. Um, so there are a lot of face processing studies of kids with autism and typically developing kids. And if you just show people faces, you get an activation pattern that looks very much like this. And this is the activation pattern. But what is really interesting, again, this is irrespective of diagnosis. This is across TD and ASD kids. 
Um, and these are subjects in the, in the risk group, in the intermediate, uh, in the non-risk group, and, um, and this is the difference between groups. And just what I wanted to show you is, look how different these activation profiles in, it, it, these activation profiles are, um, particularly in this, you know, this whole um, you know, temporal and occipital region. Look how different those activation profiles are, again, with this single, um, gene single nucleotide polymorphism difference. The genetic background tells you a lot about what the activation pattern is going to be on a single gene. It's, a, it's extremely powerful, um, the, these differences. Um, and so then um, what Jeff did was uh, pulled out some of these key regions and looked at them both um, just by genotype and looking at the, um, the risk, the non-risk, and the intermediate phenotypes, which, by the way, the intermediate phenotypes were not in this analysis, so this is a completely unbiased sample right here. Um, looked at the diagnosis group and then looked at the interaction. So unlike the other two genes that I showed you, where we saw the gene effects independent of diagnosis, here we see both a main effect of genotype so this would be the, the, um, uh, the, the risk, the intermediate, and the non-risk genotypes um, in this particular uh, area. This is the um, TD, this is the ASD, so we have a main effect for diagnostic group, a main effect for gene, and we have a gene by diagnostic group interaction here. So in this case, we have to say that this gene it must be interacting with some other aspects of either genetics or environment that are related to the autism diagnosis to make the expression pattern even more um, markedly different. Um, so uh, this ROI happens to be from one of these blue or decreasing areas here. Um, now, that was the activation um, data. So you saw that there was increased activation where there was increased met expression in the risk um, gene groups. But now we're looking at connectivity using the, the hub region of the default mode network. And then what we find is that in the risk group, well, actually it's probably easiest just to look at the difference between groups, and that is that um, the non-risk group has greater functional connectivity, again, in these distal parts of that same network. So the long-range connectivity is greater um, in, this, um, in the non-risk carriers compared to the risk factors, even though the activation is locally greater for the, um, the risk car carriers, the connectivity is less. So again, it, it takes us back to this notion of having abnormal connectivity, but not just an overall global reduced connectivity, but rather a local increase in connectivity, but a long-range reduction in connectivity in the genetic risk carriers. So the last thing that I want to talk about is what is the functional significance of aberrant connectivity? And we've, I've been showing you maps of connectivity, but what does it mean functionally and in processing to have abnormal connectivity? And how can we conceptualize differences in connectivity? Well, there are lots of ways that we can do it. The primary models in autism could be sort of summarized roughly as one of these models. There is like an, an under connectivity model that was originally proposed that just said everybody's just like less connected. This would be an under connectivity model. Um, there's an aberrant connectivity model which might say, well, some areas are more connected, some areas are less connected, which is a little bit um, uh, closer. Um, this is a model that's been proposed by uh, Matthew Belmonte and uh, Dan Geshwin and Jennifer Levitt of developmental disconnection, really talking about sort of the, the, the developmental progression of connectivity being what is, what is abnormal, and that's something that is potentially plastic and, and could be changed through time. So one way to, to examine connectivity is to use a series of approaches um, from graph theory. So I'm, I can't go through all of graph theory, so I'm going to just say a couple of really simple things about it. So in graph theory, we, we um, think about um, the world of the brain in terms of nodes, which would be maybe structures, maybe regions, maybe points, maybe Broadman's areas, but specific areas in the brain, and then edges, which are ways that these different areas of the brain are connected. Now, you could imagine a brain where every area is connected to every other area equally. 
okay? And that would be a really, really dysfunctional system because you would have no specialization, you'd have no preferential connections, it's like everything is just randomly connected. This is a way of looking at that in a, in a visual representation, um, but th th this would be a random, um, what a random sample of what a whole brain would look like if we looked, if we just simply you know, threw connections in uh, everywhere and there was no structure to them. But of course, that's not how the brain works, even though the brain is connected to the rest of the brain somehow, um, it does it in certain ways. Um, and so the kinds of networks that are most associated with um, biological systems are networks that we call small world networks, and they have certain properties. They have, they have small little hubs of areas that connect with each other, different modules that are connected to other modules, um, and, and they do so in, um, in relatively efficient ways. They can take shortcuts from one place to another, but everything is not connected to everything else. So if you could break that down a little bit, you can think of um, the brain as having, for example, highly interconnected modules, and this would be a metric that we'd call modularity. This is you know, how we conceive of, of brain function most of the time now. You know, think of it as this is a language module, and this is a visual perception model, and this is a, a, um, a, an auditory module. And certainly these areas would have to talk to each other, but mostly they'd be talking to themselves. Okay? So you can measure modularity. Um, by the extent to which these different areas talk to each other and don't talk to other areas except through a few small connections. Um, you can also talk about clustering. This is a, a measure of the local efficiency, clustering coefficient, and it means basically within a module, how much do the, all the different uh, nodes within a module talk to each other? So, for example, in the language system, does Broca's area talk nicely to Wernicke's area and talk to the SMA? Do they all talk together really nicely? Or does it, do you have to go through, you know, from one area, then to the next, then to the next, then to the next, which would be a very inefficient system? So we're looking for a locally efficient system, okay, that is modular. Module, um, but in which it, one area can talk to another area, um, and you can calculate this path length, how long it takes you to get from here to there. And you kind of want those path lengths to be of sort of an intermediate you know, level. There should be a balance between how quickly you can get from one place to the other and how module, modular a system is. Otherwise, if everything connects to everything else with like one connection, then again, you're going to go back to a random system. So you have to have these sort of intermediate effects where you can have some shortcuts between modules. So that's what we'd like to see in a well-functioning system. System. So we've been doing some graph analysis using resting state functional uh, MRI data, finding peak coordinates for regions within these um, uh, within these functional modules that we know about, and, and um, drawing regions around these modules, and then looking at um, the act activation patterns during a, you know long resting state periods, and seeing how um, these different systems that we know about communicate with each other, and how they are processed in a modular way, etc. So I'm just going to show you a couple of graphics of this to show what we found in individuals with autism. So one simple thing to do would be to divide up these modules into four very well-known modules, a visual one, a sensory motor one, uh, an attention network, and this is the default mode network. And anatomically, it's hard to kind of see, but this is the front of the brain, this is the back of the brain. You can tell because visual is back here, right? And um, you know, you've got this default mode in yellow that communicates from back to front, sensory motor, et cetera. And so one of the questions would be, well, um, how many connections of various sorts do you have uh, between these um, different networks, and what kind of connections um, are they, and how do they differ between TD and ASD individuals? And what we found was, for all the networks, there were many more negative connections uh, across modules in the typically developing kids compared to the ASD kids um, compared to the reverse. And that should make sense because it tells us that these are, modu these are separate module modules and they don't want to be highly connected with each other. You, they want to be sort of antagonistic towards each other because they want to work together. They want to work by themselves. Another way of visualizing that would be like this. And so this is a, a breakdown of two networks, again, based on resting state studies. Um, the task positive network and the task negative um, network. So this would be regions that are involved primarily in um, paying attention, the dorsal attention stream, et cetera. And these, this would be primarily default mode regions. 
and, th and so this is a graphic representation of what these different networks look like in a typically developing group. And so you can see that these networks are highly modular, right? So these areas in the task positive network all talk very closely to each other. The task negative regions all talk very closely to each other. But the two of them communicate through a single module in the cingulate. And that makes a lot of sense because you'd want one area to basically tell you on, off, you know, pay attention, don't pay attention, uh, pay attention to this, switch to that. Um, if they were overly connected, then you wouldn't have much of a, of a way of differentiating what you should be paying attention to, what you should not be paying attention to. Here's the same graphical representation in children with ASD, and you can see that both within the networks, there's a less tightly um, connected, less, less tight modularity within the, um, uh, the networks, and you can see that they're connecting with each other way too much. Um, so what's happening is that the task positive and the task negative networks are, are not, um, they're, they're connected abnormally with each other. They're not segregated and they're not modular to the extent that they should be. Um, so this is you know, just another example. Um, this is a summary slide of several of the, of the group networks that we have, the networks that we have um, network properties that we've identified in both TD and ASD. And in all of these major properties that I talked to you about earlier, we see big differences between the TD and the ASD kids. Uh, these are different levels of sparsity, which I'm not gonna talk about. Um, basically, what the result is that no matter how you look at the data, it's very, very robust. You see the same effects. Um, and that is that the modularity is not right, the path length is not right, and the uh, local efficiency, the clustering, is not right. Um, and so these are major properties of how a good biological system should be connected. And all of them, uh, all of these major properties seem to be impaired in autism. So you can just imagine um, how can a network of brain regions function well if it is not, if areas that are supposed to do the same thing are not well connected to each other and are not appropriately segregating from the rest of the brain and separating out cognitive processes for different purposes and not communicating in efficient ways and in the most efficient ways with each other, how disorganized a brain that would be. Um, and it's interesting because if you just look at the structure of the brain, it, it looks fine. And you can look with your naked eye to you know, as many brains of autism, autistic kids as you want. They, the brains look fine. Um, but they're obviously not functioning fine. And these network um, properties give us some insight into what exactly is wrong, why these, why these connectivity patterns are so uh, aberrant, and why they affect behavior so profoundly. So, just to, to start to summarize, ASD risk genes that we have found, all, all the ones that we've studied, do affect uh, connectivity. They affect connectivity in TD as well as ASD children. Um, and it's not simply a matter of underconnectivity. The whole network structure, the whole dynamics of how the network is functioning is altered. Um, I also like to point out that experience drives connectivity, especially early in life. Um, and it re reinforces, in our opinion, the necessity of very early identification, valid behavioral interventions that create experience-driven changes um, that can truly affect brain development and brain connectivity. Um, and so that's why we and, and you and a lot of other places are doing these studies of, of high-risk infants. Um, the question that we're asking now with our new ACE is can we use this information to identify children early in life and intervene before they start to get autism? And so I'm just going to just show you two slides of stuff that we're doing right now. Um, one is, um, is uh, uh, EEG studies in babies, and this is a little cap system that works very, very well with, with babies. Now you just pour these EEG caps on, and they sit on their mom's lap in front of a monitor, and we can get really, really great measures of, of different um, EEG responses to tasks. And this is one that um, my uh, colleague at UCLA, Shafali Jesty, has uh, done in uh, very young children, th uh, three months old. Uh, or, I'm sorry, th these are older than that. These are um, one-year-old kids with, um, uh, with ASD and um, kids with typical development, but we're now doing it in kids starting at six weeks of age and through the first year of life every, every three months. And you can see that in these relatively young children, there are, this is just a simple task looking at, at an expected versus an unexpected stimulus, and you can see a very nice uh, difference in um, this uh, P300, um, which is, um, 
something that's associated with, you know, with learning something novel and, and is responding to something that's familiar. And that difference is, is quite robust, and it doesn't require the kids to do anything except sit in the mom's lap and look at some pictures. So it's really easy to do in very young children. Um, and the other thing I want to show is the functional MRI studies. And this is just a single kid we've done about, uh, we're just about out of a dozen kids we've done um, to look at both resting state and activation connectivity in um, infants who are um, six weeks old. So we're looking at ultra high risk kids, kids with one or with two siblings with autism or one sibling with autism and another family member affected and looking to see if we can identify some of these networks. And I just wanna show you that this is an eight week old normal um, uh, infant, that is an infant of a, of a, of a typically developing, of a, without, without any uh, ASD siblings. And the primary networks that we talked about before, we can identify even at six weeks of age, uh, sensory motor, auditory network, visual network, and even the salience network. Um, so this is really great. It means that these networks are well in entrenched very, very early in life, and we can really look at how they develop over time. And this is a functional MRI study in a six-week-old. Uh, what we did was play sounds, play words in the native language uh, English versus a non-native language Japanese and look at the difference. And you can see that even at six weeks of age, um, there's significantly more activity in language cortex in English speaking kids, in the English versus Japanese, which suggests that even at this early age, kids can distinguish between a familiar language and an unfamiliar language. And so this gives us hope that we can look at this kind of biomarker in very, very young uh, infants and start to look at differences early in life. Um, which leads us towards an emerging mo model of autism, of abnormal white matter development, and functional connectivity. It seems to be consistent across imaging studies, and it probably begins before birth, because I can't believe that that much happened in the first six weeks of life. I mean, I think that this is probably starting very, very early. Um, and um, it's probably the case, although we haven't proven it yet, that the phenotypic heterogeneity that characterizes autism is reflected in the multitude of different kinds of risk genes. So far, we have at least shown that the risk genes that we have found affect different parts of the, of the brain, um, although in similar ways. Um, and th those are related to, the, the, um, to specific behaviors, which I think will give us a better understanding of gene, brain, behavior, trajectories, and relationships. Um, and hopefully, ultimately, use these as biomarkers for intervention and ultimately um, prevention. And then just as a caveat, I want to say that it, these um, genes that I've talked to you about today are found in both um, children with autism and children without autism. So these are not causal genes. Um, we see the same effects in controls. So we have to assume that these risk genes are simply biasing the brain towards certain modes of processing. And then somehow if we reach a threshold or we have enough of them or if we have enough environmental influences or if we don't have enough protective genes, that ultimately that's just going to lead us over to some threshold um, of autism. And even though the genes have region-specific effects, the overall pattern continues to be the same, and it's one of decreased longer range of global connectivity, um, in some cases increased local connectivity, and then just this globally disorganized, non-biological-like um, uh, network organization. Um, and it suggests that the genetic background should have significant effects on brain phenotypes, and hopefully, ultimately, this will lead us towards targeted treatments that are based on both the genetic background and the brain biomarkers um, that will help us really get a handle on that heterogeneity. So with that, I would like to thank, in particular, my, my colleagues at UCLA, specifically Morella DiPretto, who's um, really been leading most of the imaging studies now that I most, uh, I'm primarily a, a grant writer these days, and uh, all of our fantastic students Students, our close colleagues Dan Geshwin, Pat Levitt, our um, funding sources, um, kids and their families, and, um, and all of you for your attention. Thank you so much for the invitation. So for the catnap in the oxytocin receptor genes, uh, there were effects on brain organization, but they were similar, as you said, in, in, in individuals with autism and typically developing individuals. 
but then for the Met, you had the interaction, so there were different effects. And so I just want to understand how you think about this. Does, does that mean that the Met gene is somehow more important or closer to an etiological source than, than the other genes? I, I don't necessarily think that. Um, and uh, if I went into a little bit more detail on the oxytocin gene, you would see that um, that in almost every region, we found um, effects that were common across groups, but there was one region, the amygdala, that had a specifically, that had an interaction with, with, um, with diagnostic group as well. I suspect that each gene, every gene is going to have its own profile of activity, right? Some are going to be highly interactive with other genes, some are not. Um, some are going to be highly additive with other genes along the same pathway, um, some may not. Um, so I don't think that any that there's any one gene pattern that's explanatory. I think that e e all of these genes are going to have their own little effects, and what we finally end up with in terms of a diagnosis is going to depend upon all of the different hits that we have along all the different pathways that we have. And maybe you have to reach a threshold of so many genes in this pathway, this pathway, and this pathway to get a diagnosis of autism, and if you've got less in this pathway, then you don't have this phenotype, but you do have this phenotype. Um, do I think the MET gene is more important? I don't know. I mean, Pat Levitt thinks it's more important, but, but um, I don't know what's most important. I, I, just, I don't think that, I don't think I could really answer that right now, because I think that we've only looked at three genes, and there are 150 of them out there that we have to look at, so who knows? Hi, I was just curious to know if anyone has looked at how the risk allele transcript or any of the risk allele transcripts differ from the non-risk allele transcripts, or how the, the, the change in the allele affects the, you know, the protein, assuming that that's what the genes are coding for. Um, so you're basically asking about gene expression studies and whether we're doing that kind of a thing right, right now. Um, so yeah, so um, the geneticists do, and we are doing expression studies on everything that we've got right now, and when you invite Dan Geshwin to give a talk, he'll tell you all about that. I'm not a geneticist, so I don't want to speak to that. Um, I, I mean, it's an important question you know, to know exactly. I, it, there, there could be... Yeah, I mean, there could be other genes that just describe whether the risk genes are even having an effect, for example. I, I, I just don't know. But, um, but we are trying to do blood expression, and um, when we have slice preps, we do feel tissue expression, and hopefully we'll learn more over time. So you re really didn't talk about the frequencies of these genetic variants, and, uh, and, I'm, and I'm wondering, you know, maybe you could comment on that, but, but more to the point, do you have any evidence for additive effects of any of these genes? Were you lucky enough to find subsets of kids who had, you know, um, you know any of the SNPs and also had a, you know, so? Yeah, um, so that's a, a, a good question. So the only thing that we've looked at, I, I, we are extremely interested in this question right now. Um, first of all, these are all common polymorphisms, some a little bit more common than others. So um, in most of the cases, the risk alleles that we're talking about are the less common um, uh, uh, allelic variants, but we're talking, you know, 20% frequencies to 45% frequencies. So that's, the allelic frequencies are very high. They're extremely com common polymorphisms. The only thing that we've done thus far in additive effects is the oxytocin stuff that I showed you where we just looked at as many different SNPs in the oxytocin receptor gene. But what we haven't done is looked at um, the oxytocin risk genes and the MET risk genes and the CATNAT risk genes together, which you know we will do next. Um, the it, and there's so many ways to approach thinking about that as well, and we're still arguing amongst ourselves about exactly how to do that. For example. What I want to do is to look at genes that are along the same signaling pathway and then look at multiple hits along that signaling pathway and see if that will lead us towards a specific phenotype, okay? And, and we've got other genes that are along other signaling pathways, or, um, like the catnap gene is also very closely related to the FOXP2, which is also low, you know, associated with a language phenotype. So, so my idea would be to look at genes that, that are along the same pathways that should have similar effects um, downstream and add those up 
um, and, and do it that way. But then others say, no, no, <laughs> that's not the way to do it. The, the way to do it is to look at genes across different pathways and add them all together. And then, of course, we don't really know how to add gene effects together because, you know, additive, I mean, everything perhaps is linear to first approximation, but we don't know if they're additive effects or multiplicative effects or there's, you know, we, we can get some idea about um, dominance um, by looking at the pattern of results. Like we, I didn't talk about this today, but we know that some of these genes ha are clearly have dominance patterns and some clearly do not. Um, so we can tell a little bit about that, but we just need so much more. It's just, there's just so much more to do. I, and I think it's really important to do. It's just how do we want to do it? And because we only have so many kids and we only have so many genes we're allowed to look at before we start running into multiple comparison problems, we want to make sure that we're doing it right you know, because you, you know, we can't just try 20 different models and then find one that works and I think that's okay. So I understand the concept of using imaging for biomarker analyses. It's very appealing. And I understand the concepts that you've presented and the methods you've presented. But what I'm really struggling with is the feasibility. So within a given mutation, everybody who has the catnap mutation, do you see the same percentage of different levels of activation as compared to typicals? And within a given person with a catnap 2 mutation, if you tested them a second and a third time, would you get a very stable abnormality? Yeah, so I mean, all the, th the things that I've shown you today are group effects. And there's, um, although the effects at the group level aren't actually that small, they're pretty robust. Um, and I guess I didn't really emphasize it here, but every study that we've done, we validate in a second cohort to make sure we've got the same results. Um, so we do know at the group level we've got the same results, but that's extremely different from saying that we have a biomarker on the, at the imaging level. I think really what we're, the, the general model that we're probably moving towards is trying to find, to identify pathways through imaging in group studies, um, try to relate that to more and more subtle behaviors that are cheaper to do, for example, the EEG stuff, uh, where we can you know, hone in on, on you know, specific patterns, regions, et cetera, because that's way cheaper. Because there's no way we're going to scan you know, babies to diagnose autism. I mean, that, that's just not going to happen. But we hope by putting what we are doing now together with you know, genetic risk factors, we can start to look at you know, multi, the, this multitude of, of, uh, of risk things, risk behaviors, and um, uh, you know, cheaper methodologies to do it. So this, I, I don't, a lot of people ask me, well, when are you gonna you know, have fMRI as a, as a biomarker or a diagnostic tool? And I, I just, I don't think that's what's gonna happen. Uh, to me, this is still you know, trying to understand what is wrong with the brain systems. And as we learn a lot more about that, hopefully we'll come up with better ways of measuring it. Uh, for example, we can study functional connectivity in, with EEG as well. It's just that our special resolution is so much better in fMRI and we can do it much more precisely but once we really know what we're looking for and we get really, really good you know, images and we know exactly how to, to measure that, then we can start to go back to EEG data, for example, and find better EEG um, measures based on what we know, you know we can get in fMRI. So you know, I, I think it's just too much to ask that we can spend, you know, it costs, it, it costs me $600 an hour, but it'll cost an average person going to a scan or $3,000 to get an MRI scan, and I, I just I don't see it. I don't think it's going to happen. If you have sort of um, sort of lower local efficiency and kind of shorter path lengths, how how do those things reconcile with one another? And and so, in other words, so why wouldn't you have you know longer path lengths and worse local connectivity? So I'm I'm kind of trying to wrap my brain around how these things are descriptive of what's going on, and that leads me to a question of heterogeneity in autism. And I'm wondering if you guys are going in a direction of trying to find, is there is there some way of sort of um, looking at individual differences within this connectivity so that this kid has shorter path lengths, but this one has, you know, and, and the modular connectivity seems pretty normal, but it's the path lengths that are different. So I'm just kind of wondering where you guys are getting to in those kind of analyses. So, uh, so for the second part of your question, for um, you know, individual differences, um, I mean, I just don't know where that's going to go yet, so I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, um, uh, so I, 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 just, I just don't know where we're, we're just going to have to look. We're, we're still um, trying to get the metrics down well enough so that we're confident with how we're actually doing the graphs 
and confident with what we're doing. And then you can start doing classifications to see, you know, because ultimately what we want to do is if we're going to look at heterogeneity, what we, heterogeneity, what we need to do is find phenotypic heterogeneity and then relate that back to the, um, you know, modular clustering um, heterogeneity that we see. And I, I just, I don't think we're quite ready to do that, although I hope soon. So the, um, so the local and global efficiency thing, it actually, there's, there, there are metrics that compare local versus global efficiency together um, that, that come up with a um, sort of an overall um, metric of, um, of, uh, of global function and there are, there are a variety of different descriptors. Every every day, somebody comes up with a new graph theory descriptor. My favorite new one is the Rich Club, the Rich Club theory, um, which uh, means that you've got certain modules that are highly in, enriched and highly, you know, hi, uh, highly interconnected. Um, so there's there's nothing wrong with having um, short path lengths within a module. So that's great. What you don't want is short path lengths between modules, and that's what we see more of in autism. So when we talk about it, you know it, and and I should also point out um, uh, when we're talking about path lengths, we're not talking about distance in the brain. We're talking about the number of connections one has to make to get from one place to the next. So if, um, so I could have two regions right next to each other and have 10, you know, edges to get from this area to that, um, right, even though they're right next to each other. And that would be bad. Um, uh, so, so we're not really talking about distances. So you, you, you can't map on local efficiency directly with, um, with, with, um, with path length because um, uh, one of the graphs, I don't even want to go back here and show you with this, but one of the graphs show, actually showed the, um, the relationship between um, uh, local and global uh, efficiencies at different anatomical distances of pathways, which you can also uh, do. So what we're seeing in autism is that there are a lot more connections in local anatomical, in anatomically close by areas that are not necessarily module and efficient. And they are connected to their neighbors, which should be part of different modules, but they're connected to them in many ways. So we get lots and lots of these little, little connections all over the place, right? When what we should have is a cluster of short connections right here, of, of extremely efficient connections, okay? And then a cluster of extremely efficient connections right here, and one you know, node in between connecting these two areas. And that's and that would be like the long term the long run connection that we're talking about. Okay. So I don't know if that helps to, to clarify it. it. It's complicated because the terminology in, in graph theory distance it, it, graph theory does not refer to physical distance. Um, uh, that's why they call it graph in that, you know, that's that's the whole notion of it. It, it refers um, uh, to not to physical distances, but to um, nodal different nodal differences, the number of nodes, and that could be all you know in a little tiny space like that. Thanks for that talk, Susan, and thanks for making it so understandable okay. to us non-biological scientists. <laughs> I'm interested when you were t when you introduced the talk, you were talking about associations with behavior, and are you looking at behaviors other than core autism symptoms? And do you have anything to tell us about? relationships with behavior. Yeah, um, so I didn't talk about that because we're focusing on core autism symptoms and we do have some other behaviors that we are looking at, um, but we haven't related them directly to the genes yet, so I didn't bring that up. So for example, we are looking very closely right now at sensory hypersensitivities and at that particular phenotype because it varies quite a lot between individuals as you know. And so that's, that's and, and we think that that's related to specific genes that are related to anxiety and we know we've got a pretty good idea of what brain areas are, are related to it and why it, you know, so we're, so that's like one thing that we're looking at. Um, and the other kinds of phenotypes that we are gonna be focusing on are going to be things like the EEG phenotype. So one of the things that we're doing in our ACE grant is looking at you know, the response to novel objects in the P300 and um, gamma power and theta power uh, in, in uh, three-month-old EEG um, uh, data and that kind of a thing. So we are doing that as our ACE, that's our 
that's part of our, our ACE. Um, uh, we are focusing less on some of the other more complicated behaviors that we see later on in autism because our focus right now is going to be on the first year of life. So, um, so we're trying to find um, uh, behaviors that are um, that are measurable, that are n not highly variable due to context, and um, and that are quantitative. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.